denizens of the night. Welcome to another episode of the macabre, the terrifying. Broadcasting live from inside the drop ceiling in an abandoned call center, I will be your guide through the witching hours. Tonight, we'll get to take a look into the life of someone who lives on the leading edge of crisis. Our protagonist, Kylie, is a 911 operator, which means she's the one who picks up the phone when you dial the emergency line. Even under normal circumstances, that is a tough job. But you guessed it. These aren't just any normal circumstances. Not everyone who dials 911 in Greenbrier is human. And not every incident that happens there can be explained naturally. This story is called I'm a 911 Operator and Some of Our Calls Are Strange and was written by Hobo Sam 21. I'm a 911 operator, and our district is woefully underfunded for the amount of strange calls we receive. I don't enjoy my job, but opportunities are scarce, and the call center was within walking distance of where I live. Calls range from normal things, like domestic disputes and burglary, to the not-so-normal, like shaved animals, and structures not being where they should or being where they shouldn't. To show you what I mean, this is a call that I thought was going to be in the normal category. 11.52 p.m., the phone rang. I dropped my book and put the receiver to my ear. 911, what is your emergency? A small voice replied in a quiet tone. I need a policeman to come. Hearing a child's voice on the line was an unwelcome surprise. Sure thing, dear. Can you tell me what's going on? I could hear unsteady breathing. As much as I wanted to, I knew better than to ask again. Finally, the little girl replied, A bad man is in my house. My heart dropped. I had police ready to roll within minutes. Okay. Can you tell me where you are and if you are safe? I waited for her reply. She spoke in a quieter voice. I'm at my house. I'm hiding in my closet under my clothes. I think he hurt my mommy. The matter of fact way she spoke was heartbreaking. I got an address from her and was told police would arrive in five minutes. The police are on their way. They'll be there soon. Just stay quiet and stay on the phone, okay? We have a police radio set up in the call center. I turned it on and listened. The first officer said, Dispatch, we've arrived. The building looks run down and vacant. Approaching the front. Front door is unlocked. The second officer spoke. Back door is also unlocked. Moving in. I could hear the creak of a door opening through my headset. They were in the right place. My heart beat hard. I whispered into the mic. The police are there. Let them search the house. The girl giggled. I know. I sat frozen. Her reply was wrong. It made me feel queasy. I jumped as the police radio came to life. I got a body here. It's a real mess. Either an animal attack or a psycho with a bladed weapon. Continuing my search for the girl. The girl's voice humming a nursery rhyme floated through my headset. I couldn't turn it off. I couldn't hang up. One of the officers cussed loudly. What the hell is that? There was a gunshot followed by screaming. So much screaming. Ripping fabric, screams of pain, and unidentifiable wet sounds flooded my ears. 
As fast as it began, it ended. All that remained was the humming. With tear-filled eyes, I looked over at my supervisor, who had patched into my line. His face mirrored my own, shock and disgust. I nearly fell out of my chair when the girl's voice spoke again. Thank you. She giggled once more. Heavy breathing was all I heard as I reached over and hit the disconnect button. My supervisor walked over to the map of our county. He took a red pin from the box and pressed it into the map. It joined a hundred other red pins, each marking an address that we wouldn't send responders to. Regular calls were marked with green pins. Yellow pins were for anomalous calls. And red, as mentioned before, was reserved for places that we would not return to. That last call I shared was a bit... heavy. Luckily, we don't get ones like that super often. Yes, our map has a lot of red, but that's decades of records. And yeah, red calls have increased exponentially the last couple years. But things aren't always so dark here at Greenbrier 911. I was nearly at the end of my night shift when the phone lit up. I put on my headset and hit the button. Greenbrier 911, how can I assist you? The voice on the other end belonged to a woman, likely middle-aged and very annoyed. I need an officer here with a gun. Ma'am, are you in danger? Can you give me a location? The caller sighed obnoxiously. Would I be calling if I didn't need you? Stop wasting time and send an officer! Her voice got shrill enough at the end to make me wince. My supervisor noticed and gave me the all good signal. I gave him two thumbs up. Of course, ma'am. Could you give me an address or crossroad? She growled into the phone. You waste my taxes on stupid stuff, but you can't track my call? Fine. Corner of Grover and Third. I thanked her and asked for any details. She replied back loudly, There is a moose in my bathtub. I go to take my morning shower and there's a freaking moose standing in my tub. I wasn't sure what to say. I had expected a noise complaint or a report of a suspicious person, not a wild animal. I typed the info into the computer and sent it to the police dispatch. Not a minute later, my personal phone lit up with a text. Yo, Kylie, you mean to say moose? Andrew was dispatching tonight. I confirmed that I did indeed mean a moose. That's whack. I'll let the officers know. Twenty minutes later, I was listening to the entire fiasco on the police radio. Animal control managed to tranquilize the animal, only to find out it didn't fit through the door. So, they ended up removing an exterior wall. Using a reach forklift, they lifted the poor animal out of the bathtub. But in the process, it woke up and tore free from its bindings. The moose fell to the ground, but appeared unharmed as it ran into the woods. As to how it got in there, your guess is as good as mine. Night shift is a different game altogether. It's like people shut off their brains once the sun goes down. It's hard to find people willing to pull graveyard partially because of craziness, but mostly because of Jordan. He used to be a big shot editor for some East Coast newspaper before getting fired and moving to little old Greenbrier. Rumors flowed through the office as to why he got fired, none of them very flattering, but Jordan brought that upon himself. He was an ass. Show up five minutes late, expect to be written up. Missed a detail on a call? Write up. Someone calls back to complain about you? You guessed it. A write up. 
I'm a pretty quiet person that tends to stick to doing my job while on duty. I think that's the main reason Jordan doesn't bother me. I would still prefer day shift, but since I got an extra dollar an hour working nights and can get along with the night shift supervisor, I often find myself taking more night shifts than most. I received a call on one of my night shifts that still bothers me today. It had been a peaceful night. We had a single call earlier about a raccoon stealing garbage cans and hiding them in the woods. Animal Patrol had their hands full dealing with the 37-pound animal, but no one was harmed and the trash cans were returned to their owners. 5.02 a.m. The phone rang. Greenbrier 911, what's your emergency? A male voice answered, his tone already frustrated. Hi, uh, this is going to sound dumb, but I'm stuck in my house. All right, sir, who am I speaking with and are you in immediate danger? The man replied. James, James Oswald. No, I don't think so. It's just that I can't get out. Look, I just need someone to come open the door, okay? James, are you saying your door won't open? Have you tried your back door or a window? James' voice took on a bit of annoyance. Do you think I haven't already tried that? I've been stuck in here for a while and have tried everything short of breaking down a wall, okay? I need someone to come here and possibly break the door down. Okay, James. I'll have the fire department out there as soon as they can. What is your address? He seemed appeased. I got his address and forwarded it to the Greenbrier Fire Department dispatch. I talked with James while he waited for help to arrive. He explained that he had tried kicking the door down, but couldn't do it. He even tried the windows, but they were security glass and he couldn't break them either. I found that a little odd, but didn't comment on it. 30 minutes later, I got a message from the fire department that they were on site. I heard their voices come on over the radio. Greenbrier Fire Department, is anybody home? There was no reply. They called out a few more times. Greenbrier Fire Department, can you hear us? Are you in need of assistance? Hello? James was quiet. I called out to him through my headset. James, the fire department is at the front door. Can you hear them? I could hear James's breathing, but it was irregular at this point. Feeling uneasy, I radioed the first responders. Hey guys, be aware. Something feels off about this. <sighs> yeah, I don't know what to tell you. There ain't a whole lot going on here. The house is abandoned. Nobody's home. Doesn't look like anybody has been for years. Front door was even unlocked. I could hear their footsteps echoing as he talked to me through the radio. We're going to do a quick check of the entire area, but we got busted open windows, unlocked doors, and enough dust to grow corn in. Feeling a little bit annoyed, I turned off the radio and focused on the headset. Okay, James, is this some sort of prank? I heard what sounded like a sniffle, and James's voice returned. Please, please don't hang up. Whatever you do, just please don't hang up. The desperation in his voice was real. I don't know if I'll be able to get through again. It's been so long, so damn long. I've tried calling every day. I tried calling, but no one ever answers. If they do answer, they can't hear me, and they hang up again. Please, just... just hear me out, okay? I didn't abandon my family. I didn't run away. God, they must be thinking the worst of me by now. I was just doing my job, okay? I was checking out the building. I'm a home inspector. It's what I do. I inspect places. I came in, and no one was here, so I did my job. But I couldn't get out. I miss them. I don't know why I can't get out. His speech was fast and panicked. 
Hold on, James. Are you claiming to be in the house? Yes, he shouted. I'm in the house, okay? I've been here for who knows how long. There's a phone on the wall. I try every day to call out, to get somebody to answer, to get somebody to show up and get me out of this hellhole. So I'm begging you, please do not hang up. I haven't heard a voice in so long. I need to know. No, I need my family to know. I need them to know I didn't abandon them. My little boy. My little boy needs his daddy. James was becoming frantic. My name is James Oswald. I'm a home inspector. I tried to cut in. James, I need you to... Please, for the love of all that is holy, save me. His voice roared through my headset. I winced at the sudden increase in volume. He broke into sobs, punctuated by a few incoherent words. The voice of James Oswald began to fade into static. He made a few more pleas before the line went dead. I sat there, trying to comprehend what I'd just heard. Was it an elaborate prank? Or something so much worse? Jordan leaned back in his chair so as to look out of his office at me. Kylie, don't forget to pin the call. He went back to whatever it was he was doing, as if the call we had just received was some mundane, stuck cat in a tree request. Numbly, I did as he said. I pressed a yellow pin into the address the call had claimed to come from. When I got home that night, I couldn't stop thinking about James. I had to know if there was any truth to his story. I googled his name, and a plethora of results came up. Missing persons reports. News recordings of his distraught wife begging people to come forward with any information. I couldn't bring myself to watch the clip of James's five-year-old son talking about his missing father. Just the thumbnail brought tears to my eyes. The sadness weighing that child down at such a young age. I considered contacting the family. I don't know what I would have told them, but I felt like they needed closure. They deserved something. But the most recent date was 1986. James's son would be older than me by now. No, it wouldn't be helpful. I closed my laptop. I wouldn't open up old wounds. I'm tired. I think I'm going to call it a night. Oof. That last call sounded particularly harrowing. Doesn't it sound like there's some kind of rift open in Greenbrier? It would explain how monstrous little girls got in. How a man could walk into a building and wind up in literal limbo. And maybe even the moose incident. Stories like this one remind me how much I enjoy urban fantasy. Because that genre explores what the world might realistically be like if wizards and monsters walked among us in modern day cities. Horror does the same thing, of course. But the balance of power is always in favor of the monsters! <laughs> if you enjoyed this story, please check out the author in the links below. They have a subreddit where they've posted more of their work, so you can find more from them there. Please also leave a like on this video and subscribe to hear more stories like this one. Whatever you do, be nice to the worker who answers your call for help with a supernatural entity, and don't fall asleep. Ha 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 